Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Jeff uh, Schrager. Uh, who is visiting uh, us uh, from Stanford and Cancer Commons. Um, so uh, Jeff uh, got his PhD from uh, CMU uh, with uh, Herb Simon uh, and, and then went on to do a lot of uh, interesting, exciting stuff, including pioneering in uh, e-commerce and working on a computing platform for uh, farmers. So uh, and today he, he will probably talk us uh, about uh, tell us a bit more about uh, molecular tumor board, which is an exciting frontier in genomic medicine. And um, so, without further ado, here's Jeff. Oh, by the way, uh, for people who are uh, online, uh, you can uh, actually hit a button uh, to ask questions. So I will be monitoring your questions and then uh, ask Jeff in real time. Um, so feel free to uh, send in more questions. Yeah, you have, to, you have to write, annoyingly interrupt the speaker in angle brackets, and then... Um, to be clear, by the way, that was soft... I was working on software for pharmas, not farmers. Just that was not... Just in case it wasn't, wasn't obvious speaking. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, mountain bikes, I'm, I'm told, which is what MTB stands for. So th the original title of this talk was Tools for Molecular Tumor Boards, but I never do this be just before a talk. I decide to reach, change your slides, which, of course, I do. Um, most of what I'm going to be talking about is tools that actually are built in conjunction with molecular tumor boards or the equivalent of molecular tumor boards to be used for molecular tumor boards. And so I retained it to tools, you know, to quote a famous philosopher, by fore end of molecular tumor boards. Um, and you'll see how that, how that plays out. So um, this is the outline. So I'm going to be it's relatively short, although that has a lot of sub pieces. Um, and I'll start off by talking about precision oncology, which is um, essentially the problem that we're dealing with is a decision problem, which is what drugs or more generally treatments to give to who when. Or and some of the treatments could be non-treatments. Depending upon many dimensions of the phenotype, there are many decisions to be made. And that sounds like a fairly simple problem. And in fact, early on in medicine, it was a fairly simple problem. So in the sort of pre-omic era, there were you know, approximately 10 different um, phenotypes, lung cancer, breast cancer. What does omic stand for? Oh, uh, omic is, so genomic is the word for uh, basically genome. Omic is like you take star omic, right? So genomic, metabolomic, um, you know, you know well, proteomic, ex exomic, blah, 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 omic. So it's just short for everything, star omic. Big data in medicine. Yeah, basically. And we're going to get bigger, actually, very quickly. <laughs> so um, there were approximately 10 phenotypes which were histologically, see now we're getting all the terms, that's not here unfortunately, which were histologically defined, breast, lung, cancer, et cetera, um, and there were a few chemotherapies, right? And in that world, you can, so what would happen is somebody would show up and they'd do a biopsy and then they'd select some treatment and then there was some regimen for doing the treatment and then they'd see what happened, right? Pretty simple model. Um, in that world, so this is the world of today, in the omic world, and I would, it's pretty hard to show an infinite matrix. So essentially, so I'll use the technical term 11 d zillion. Um, so basically it's an 11 d zillion by 11 d zillion dimension problem, where you have not only single treatments, but there are treatments coming online all the time, combinations of treatments, different plans for different treatments, all kinds of stuff to be done on the treatment side, and as I'm sure you're familiar, even if you've just you know, been reading the news, there are thousands and thousands, you know, tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of different dimensions on the general phenotype side, right? So if you just look at the genome, you have, depending on how you count, from 16,000 to three gig worth of uh, information just in the genome itself. Um, of the patient. And notice, by the way, in cancer, you're talking about not only the patient's um, natural genotype, but also some tumor, some mutation, which caused the problem. So there's genomics everywhere. And in this world, the workflow, although it has the same, it still looks like a circle, is very different. So essentially, there are still biopsies. You run the panomics, essentially get all the data you can out of, out of the patient and the history of it. Um, do some kind of complicated targeting decision-making. 
um, some kind of complicated treatment planning. Sometimes you can test the, the proposed treatment in mice, in, in uh, other patients, um, hopefully first. Uh, run the combo therapy, do much more uh, time, much more time, short time uh, observation of what's going on. You don't have to basically wait five years for the person to either die or, or uh, be cured. And then they recur or, you know, don't recur. Now, in 2011, we published a paper that was a review of the different techniques at the time, the different problems at the time in cancer. And we claimed that AI could cure cancer. I'm not sure I would claim that today. In fact, I would claim the opposite today. Um, and we divided it into three different kinds. I don't expect you to read this. I just want to give you the three different gross categories of problems that we identified. You can go to the paper if you care. Um, there were knowledge opportunities, basically get all the knowledge there is. There were um, learning opportunities, which is essentially observe what happens when you do something and then um, update your models. And there were planning opportunities. Now, most folks focus on, reasonably enough, focus on the knowledge and data because computer science is kind of these days anyway, is a knowledge and data kind of field. And in fact, this is the second part of this. So uh, the, it's, it's the obvious thing to do. And so what we and other people have created are uh, knowledge and literature-based tools for tumor boards generally. And I'm going to show you an example of this because I'm going to go to the for, by, and of version of this. So this is a particular project. Um, some of this I'm going to skip through because it's going to be calls to Newcastle for you folks. Um, so this is focusing on the modeling. Essentially, really, this is treatment selection or treatment ranking. So you do something which implicates a model and then choose a treatment, and then it goes into treatment planning. So what happens here generally is you say, OK, we're going we're to scrape the literature, get some bunch of information, which is approximately a disease model. It could be a molecular model or not. I'll show you molecular and non-molecular versions of it. And then use that in treatment selection. So this is, this is sort of the obvious thing. And so what you're doing is trying to take broad-based omics, broad-based research, somehow mix them together and come up with, of course, answers to various questions. The, the most relevant question for a patient is which drugs are applicable to which, which phenotype. But there are, if you have this data, you can answer other kinds of questions. So a particular instance of this is a project that we did with um, Muccellin et al. in Muccellin. It's an Italian name. I have a little trouble pronouncing it. Um, and uh, they had a bunch of physicians, oncologists, that had formed this molecular, melanoma molecular map project, right? And what they did is they went out and they built melanoma molecular maps, right? And so they went and they, they were experts at this, and they built a bunch of PowerPoint slides, essentially. So there's no underlying representation to this. And uh, mapped out, there were like 20 of them, and they mapped out. It's a very complicated system, as, as are all of these. And then they did this other interesting thing. So they had all these pictures, and they said, OK, well, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the literature, and we're going to create this thing called the Targeted Therapy Database. So the Targeted Therapy Database was a spreadsheet, and it was built by, I'll show you this a, a little bit closer in a minute. It was manually created over a decade of melanoma research by experts in the field. Right? And experts, you know, biologists are really good at filling in spreadsheets. Right? They really like to deal with them. They can deal with them very well and um, are good. So what they did is, uh, this is now a close-up of the same thing. They're all, I just selected the BRAF part. So this is the, the molecule, the gene of interest in this particular case, the particular mutation. I see there are lots of entries with respect to that, and there are refer you know, the reference, the paper that was scraped for that information. And they read the paper, and they decided, basically one line per paper, approximately, um, whether that paper for a BRAF mutation showed that this was sensitive to whatever drug. So this is the drug. Sometimes the drug had an alias. So far, that's relatively obvious. The interesting thing is these columns here. <clears throat> the model is what kind of experiment was done. Okay? And the number of cases, which is sometimes irrelevant if it's a laboratory experiment, is uh, how many observations. So in this particular case, a 537 is an observational study with 37 human subjects. All right? Notice that a 6 some number, of which there were many. This is just a little piece of 1,000. I think it was a 1,400-line table, 1,400-row table. A six would be randomized called trial, and a seven would be a meta-analysis. All right? We'll get back to this, so sort of keep that in mind. Then you can do, and this is where I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because you'll all understand it without me having to explain it. You basically do some fairly simple, straightforward statistics, and you can score um, 
the uh, likelihood that a different molecule is going to actually have an impact on melanoma given that particular observed mutation. All right? So we built a tool to do this, and the tool had a couple of interesting features. Yes? Previous slide. Sure. So when you when you combine all this evidence, do you treat all those each of those lines uh, as a uniform way, or do you wait? Uh, they're weighted by the by the model. That's exactly right. So they're weighted by the model and the number of observations, okay. right? But other than that, they're uniform, right? So that's why that model is in there exactly. Um, so. You take that table, you take the math that's underlying it. By the way, this is published, so you can go to the paper if you really wanted to see the math. And uh, do the obvious thing, built a web-based tool. But the web-based tool had several interesting features that I want to show you because that emphasizes this interactive, um, the interactive point I want to make. So the kind of inputs are, the this, is, this was usually set to the standard set of treatments. So the inputs are basically the observations, the tests and their results, whether they were consistent with um, that is, IL-8 is expressed, this concordant is apparently Italian for yes, and discordant is apparently Italian for no. Um, and so you uh, would, set, would set this, but the interesting thing is it would tell you, first of all, which things that you had to test. That is to say, it was ranking not only the treatments, but also the tests to do, right? So it would give you a bunch of tests, you would fill in the ones that you did, and then you'd end up with some score that basically says yay or nay, you know, what's the probability that this is actually going to have an effect. And it's more interesting when there are multiple things, so I'm actually going to skip forward to this one. Oh, sorry. So here what's going on is it tells you the references. That is, basically it shows you the rows from the prevalent hypotheses. And this was very important to the doctors. Remember, we were building this with the physicians that built the table. And so they insisted on seeing the relevant hypotheses and seeing the references, because they wanted to be able to basically go back and figure out whether to believe it or not. And we'll, that will come back to that, because that was very important. Um, that I said, it's actually just a picture of the same thing. And again, it's more interesting when there is more than one hypothesis in the set. So it's telling you essentially it's doing a, what we call this as drug ranking or treatment ranking. Okay? So this is treatment ranking based on data that was supplied by human experts reading the literature and making a judgment as to what the value is. So you can do the obvious thing and say, okay, well, we're going to semi-automate the reading of the literature. Okay? Now, it turns out to be extremely difficult for reasons that I'm sure you guys could explain to uh, me better than I can explain it to you. But essentially, the way we did this was by... Um, uh, just looking for concordance relationships, and then actually going back and having to score what the concordance, which direction the concordance relationships were. The problem with concordance relationships is, this is out of PubMed, the problem with concordance relationships is that there are, um, let's see, 2 to the, two, two the 22,000 possible combinations um, if you just do it raw. But the great thing is, that they, remember it's the Melanoma Molecular Map Project, so they actually had drawn all these nice pictures, and so we could just focus on the genes out of the pictures, right? And so that's a fairly easy thing to scrape out of the picture. In fact, mechanical trick, you can scrape the relationships also. So you, you end up with a bunch of relationships that basically say the probability for a particular gene, um, let me see, actually, uh, let me back up one slide because there's a better example. Um, right, so the probability of this is what you really want. Now, you can't really get that. That is the probability of a cure given a treatment in a disease characterization. You can get things like the probability that a gene goes with a treatment, and then you have to actually score the direction of that manually because we, we didn't have enough natural language oomph to be able to tell what direction the result was. I still think there isn't enough natural language oomph to do that. So you can go through and you can get that, and you can add those data in, and then the, then the um, experts would look at that, and they'd have to score the direction. But a more interesting thing to do is actually use exactly the same, oh, this is, uh, sorry, I had backed up. I lost my place because of backing up. But basically, we use these things to constrain what the, um, what the concordance relationships were over. Um, so more interesting thing is to go back to this and say, ah, well, if you've got human, the ability to do human observations, so 537 is an observation of seven, so seven subjects, what's 5-1? Case study, right, okay? And there's thousands and thousands of case studies in the world, many more than there are papers, right? So what you can do is you can actually start adding rows to this table for every case that comes down the line, 
right? Now, it's, it's a little complicated because they're non-independent if there are multiple observations. But, so there are details. But the idea is that eventually, if you added cases to this, then it's an extremely simple version of a learning approach from the, uh, from the data, right? Now, they don't have to publish the cases, right? You want this to be sitting there, you know, reading the cases that are coming in through the tumor boards. And I'll get to tumor boards in a second. Now, that's the obvious approach. That is the, I just abbreviated genotype there, genotype to treatment models. I abbreviated treatment also. But the problem is it's not a complete solution, not even nearly, it's not even like the 80%, the, the, the it's like more like the 10% of a complete solution. And the reason is that um, if you look at treatment planning, that is a little bit into the treatment selection, but more into the treatment planning, it's really an incredibly complicated thing. And so you don't have to read this, I've kind of written it out here. Same picture. <coughs> But now look at all the other considerations, right? So you've got the disease model, whatever information you grabbed out of the literature, which is kind of that table. You've got the patient's preferences, the treatment history, financial considerations, which is, I guess, the same thing almost as drug availability and affordability. You've got guidelines of what things are legal to do, what things have been approved, what things have not been approved, what you can get away with. Um, Tumor availability for testing is a major constraint. You might say, well, I'm going to do every test in the book. But it turns out you've only got a small amount of tumor. And every time you have to get a new tumor, you basically not only expensive, but it's exceedingly painful if you can get it at all. So all of these kinds of considerations are faced by these things. Basically, it's, uh, to add to it, broad-based clinical experience is where we're going. All right. So the question is, where do you find broad-based clinical experience? And the answer is molecular tumor boards. And that's where I'm going to spend most of the, the detailed time here. So molecular, what's a molecular tumor board? So a molecular tumor board is a team of, they're not always in the same room. Sometimes it's virtual. Sometimes it's email. But in any case, it's a group of experts in many different areas faced with the problem of treating the patient before them. Right? And I like to think of this actually more as an engineering problem than as a science problem. Right? This is. In case you don't recognize, this is Apollo 13, one of the greatest scenes in any movie, any time, when the astronauts are falling out of the sky, running out of oxygen, and, this, and they're faced with figuring out how them not to suffocate. And they pour all this junk out on a table and say, we've got to find a way to make this, this, I don't know which way it went, but basically this fit into a hole for that using nothing but this. And that's really the problem faced by molecular tumor boards also. Essentially, they, go ahead. How do you get 15 people to fit on the same timetable, even if not in the same uh, It's actually an interesting question. Let me get back to it, because I have a, uh, several different approaches to it. Okay? I mean, that's, there are many practical issues right, like that in tumor boards. So the way this generally works, in case it's not obvious, is that a patient shows up who, who has progressed on whatever treatment, standard treatment they were given usually. So these are the most advanced patients. The tumor boards basically see problem patients. And that's good. I mean, it's bad that there are problem patients. But it's good if you focus on molecular tumor boards, you're seeing the hard cases, right, first of all. So the tumor board meets. We'll get into what happens there. They come up with some hypotheses um, and some treatment strategies. And then it gets fed back to the oncologist and the patient. They make a decision on what they're going to do. They try a few things. Sometimes it comes back to the tumor board. Right? It's sort of an obvious workflow. Um, reimbursement is a big part of it. And actually, the argument for reimbursement is part of what the tumor board worries about. Right? So a significant problem. So they're facing, and the discussions they're facing is not just which treatment to select, but which treatment to select and what to do with this patient who's falling out of the sky, or worse, um, uh, given all of these considerations. And so again, there's um, a group of experts in many different fields that come together on some timetable and some discussion, often remote and email, to explicitly assemble, and I'm using model very generally, not a model in the sense of a pathway model necessarily, right? but basically some theory of what they're going to do with this patient. According to best current knowledge, reason from that theory would be a better word. Um, now, the interesting thing about tumor boards is they expose their reasoning to us. right? And so by watching molecular tumor boards in process, we're watching the in-process problem solving that these experts are doing. And they're doing all kinds of stuff. And I'll show you examples of this. Um, they're using the knowledge of open literature, et cetera. So there's two unique kinds of things that molecular tumor boards deal with. Great, lots of unique things. So first of all, they know, or they have hypotheses, which they use, about what parts of the literature are too early. 
like, what do we think really is worth looking at? Okay, they know what parts of the literature are outdated, right? Or again, every time I say I know, that means they operate as though they know. Whether, you know, what it really means for a piece of literature to be outdated in some absolute sense is unknown, but they're operating this way, right? They have to make decisions. Um, knowledge is not available at all in the literature. Ethical knowledge, all kinds of stuff literature doesn't cover many things, right? How to actually interact with the pharma over getting this drug. Um, what are the importance relationships between these different kinds of things? The, the cross-domain translations of terms, you know, we, we, we mean this by this gene, foundation medicine means that by that gene. What happens if the gene isn't there at all because it got ripped up? <clears throat> and they have heuristics that they use to do this. Basically, they're doing practical knowledge, and this you might call scientific pragmatics, right? There's another category of knowledge, which is that they basically are making arguments pro and con. So they're really trying to work this thing out um, for the hypotheses. They give you the rationale for rejecting hypotheses. This is very important because if you look at what's in a, an EHR, you only basically see what was done. Sometimes in the letter that went to support it or in the notes, you say the reason that they chose that, but you don't see the reasons that they rejected hypotheses, right? Which turn out to be, you know, I would think more important, but you, they're ne they're, they basically never get anywhere. This is totally lost information. Um, they have, this is sort of the same as the previous one, they have implicit unpublishable knowledge. Knowledge which, you know, there's no experiment, but it's in the problem solving. They have to use it. They use it every day in their actual work. And they have, the tumor boards have stats on the cases that typically occur, which you could get by looking at the, at the data that came out of the health records. But basically, they have that information in front of them in their heads some more. So you might call this in-context knowledge, right? So it's pragmatic knowledge and in-context knowledge. The distinction isn't very, um, very important. So let me show you what tumor boards use and produce. Everything you're seeing now is data, is real data, which either came from um, stuff that went into a tumor board or stuff that came out of a tumor board or stuff that was transcribed in a tumor board process, okay? And I haven't distinguished at all. Um, <clears throat> so one thing that tumor boards do is because they're meeting, you know, on a time schedule and they really have to think about this and you get all these experts to think about this problem, is they really condense the dimensionality of the problem for their reasoning. So, for example, the best example of this is they never look at the entire huge radiological history of this thing. A radiologist says, here's the important thing to look at, right? They like circle it and say, okay, this is where the tumor is, right? This is where the tumor was. Um, similarly, you get the history. Uh, they also, very often these days, molecular tumor boards will actually pick a diagram out of a paper, often a review paper, and put it up and say, okay, this is the thing we're reasoning about is the RAS pathway, okay? And, and actually, if you look at this one, this came from a real molecular tumor board, it's actually got where the drugs target and things like that and the pathway and stuff like that. So they're struggling with trying to actually do real-time reasoning about this, this situation. Um, and then they'll give explanations. So I'm going to actually go on and give you a better vision, view of this. So here's, again, data from the tumor board. This, this data comes from across the bridge, actually, Tony Blau at UW. So this is, again, the condensation of the story, right? So they give you relevant background knowledge as opposed to dumping the entire health record. Um, they, uh, this is just different selection of background knowledge now from literature and databases, not from the actual health record, right? So they went out and looked at some data and said, I don't know, for some, for some reason it's relevant to them that there are 44 of these endometrial cancers with this, with this mutation in Cosmic. Um, they uh, pick up the literature that they believe is relevant Right? And they point it out. And importantly, they often, at least in my ex experience, which isn't huge, they will, um, I'll, I'll change it to sometimes. You can sometimes see them um, state things that we can't find in the actual literature, which seem to be implications of the papers, <laughs> but aren't actually in the papers if you read them. Right? So it's essentially in context, in context reasoning about factoids. So the facts, this is well known, facts mean something different in the context of reasoning than in the context that you would read them out of a paper, which is partly why I think reading papers is slightly crazy if that's all you do. Um, they also, uh, they create explanations. So after all of this stuff, basically they collectively decide that, the, that this particular FGFR mutation is the driver of this particular tumor. Now they've got a hypothesis about what's driving it, a model if you will, all right? And so now they're gonna create a treatment plan, right? So they say, okay, we're going to try this drug and this drug, and it turns out they did, this is a little history, they did try that drug, um, some stuff about the approve, approval and non-approval of the drugs, and then um, this, I guess, is their bottom line suggestion, predicted that the BRCA and CHECK2 mutations may confer susceptible to PARP inhibitors, which is what they're going to try and use. 
And sometimes they get test results, right? So they tried it. Tumor board finds out what happened, usually fairly quickly, like on the next or you know, a few meetings later, whenever they can get the actual measurements back. So uh, this is just to point out various places. So you can find relevant models, model-based reasoning, um, background context. I said all of this as I was talking through it, so I'm just going to page through it. This is just ta annotations on the same thing that I said, essentially. Um, tests of hypotheses and outcomes. All right. So that's what tumor boards do. And go ahead. Two questions. One is, have you compared known as army intelligence people? But they do their Actually, <laughs> I'm going to get to that exact question. Okay. Right. The other is, has a mal malpractice lawsuit ever hit these uh, proceedings? I'm sure. <laughs> I have no idea what would happen. Um, my guess is that they're immune to it, essentially, by some sort of sign-off <coughs> that the patient does. But I don't know. I mean, no one's really <coughs> immune to the, to the lawsuit. But I've never heard of a tumor board being disbanded because of a lawsuit, but I, 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 it may have happened. Um, your point about the military is interesting for a bunch of reasons. Um, one is that DARPA is partly funding this. Another one is that um, one of the pictures, when I showed the picture of the tumor board, I didn't say this, but one of those pictures was actually not a tumor board. It was Afghanistan's war room. Um, <laughs> they look exactly the same, <laughs> to your point. And I'm going to actually talk about some technology that actually is used exactly the same. If you think of them as engineering teams or, to your point, Essentially, a war room process, it's exactly the same kind of thing. Yeah, right, exactly. Where, while people are dying, and you know, either in the field or you know, not. So that's, but that's the thing that makes it more interesting, is that you've actually got lives on the line. right? It's not like some random interdisciplinary sedition support for building a bridge someday in the future. right? Um, of course, money could be dying in that particular case. But. So I'm going to talk very briefly about some approaches. All right? Each of these is <laughs> partly implemented in certain ways. So the first is, this thing we call EPOC, which is the tumor board case sub. The idea here is that we want to capture the reasoning that goes on in the tumor board and use that to help reduce the dimensionality in this problem, basically give you hints. All right? So uh, we're focusing on the broad-based clinical experience. So what we're doing here is capture the reasoning. And remember, you get pro and con reasoning. So essentially, this is just a repeat of what you get. So you'll see the genomic aberration, clinical history, blah, 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 case summary, personalized decisions and the hypotheses and the rationales for the hypotheses. The most important part of these rationales for the hypotheses, right? And the rationales for the rejected hypotheses. So we capture these things um, in the obvious way. And what we're starting to do now, <coughs> partly working with Hui Feng and some others, is um, take it and code the, the relational meta-knowledge out of it, all right? And currently, this is manual, being manually coded, as you can tell by Xs and stuff left out. Um, but basically, the, the, I'm, I just manually coded this page. The idea is. I believe that the technology out there can figure out that, you know, poly-ADP ribose polymerase is a PARP. That kind of natural language technology is kind of a done deal. What's not a done deal is the relations this argument supports that, this is a fact which came out of a database and supports this, and this, you know, contradicts that and that sort of thing. So that's the kind of stuff, that's the kind of meta argument that we're manually coding now and hope to be able to semi-automatically code by essentially training on the manual code. And that gives you the explanation structures. Here's just another piece of it. Um, so these references support whatever, I'd have to read it to you, support that fact. It's, so they pulled this fact out of those references. I believe the existing technology can code what that fact is. What it can't code is the kind of meta structure of it, partly because this was written out, but often it's just spoken in a conversation. Right? So you're not actually looking at something that somebody wrote most of the time. So essentially what we're doing is, gathering it from tumor boards, semi-automatically, hopefully someday automatically coding it, and then that can be used for a bunch of different things. For physicians, they want to get, and this is, physicians want this. Physicians want to basically put their cases in, um, get similar cases out, start using them as evidence for their own reasoning and reasoning examples. Um, for payers, you get advanced intelligence on which standard therapies are being considered by thought. These are the thought leaders, right? The folks in these molecular tumor boards. Um, for pharma, it's similar. You're basically getting intelligence about how things are being considered by the thought leaders in combination with other things and really used. Um, for hospital systems, presumably, because you can make the argument to payers better this way. So these are just kind of technical. Well, the first one's not technical. So That's for what, the patients. What's the approximate volume of data you can conceivably get? Like, how many molecular tumor boards are there? Excellent question. So these are, so as of two years ago, the number was zero, okay? 
Um, as of now, the number of things that actually call themselves molecular tumor boards is probably 15, right? Wait. And the number of tumor boards that now get molecular data and have to cope with it is 100%, <laughs> essentially. All right, because essentially they're getting molecular data, some from their pathologists. Sometimes patients walk in with a foundation medicine report right, and say, look, I went and I did this thing. I got a report. Use it. <laughs> right? And so what generally happens if that's not UW is they call up somebody in some other field and say, help, we've got this you know, pile of genomic data. We don't know what to make of it. Right? Um, so it's, the number is rising quite rapidly. Go ahead, you had a question. What's a virtual molecular tumor board in the last slide? It's just one where they're not meeting. It can be virtual either in time or in space. Um, and so the time virtual, actually, usually it's both. Because what happens in practice is um, a couple of doctors will meet in an actual local tumor board or a proximal tumor board. And then they'll say, well, we don't know what the hell to do with this. And so they'll call somebody or they'll you know, send an email to somebody, describe the case. Um, and you know, send the FM report to them, and then get some guidance back. Right? Get some information back. Presumably, they also do postmortems. They do. Okay. So, very good point. I said I, I, there was an arrow for that, but I didn't make it clear. So, they very often do postmortems. So, um, what the? Not, that's the wrong word. Um, <laughs> they almost always get information back about the outcomes. Um, and that's very different than normal uh, electronic health records. So, normal health record is. If the person comes back for more treatment, you'll see that. If the person is cured, you have no idea what happened. They could have died and gone away or gone to another hospital or you know, whatever. Um, the tumor boards do follow up themselves. Right? So they'll basically, one, an admin for a tumor board will call the patient up or the patient's family up and bring that information back to the tumor boards. Um, oh, so one thing you could do with this is you could use this data to just basically do the kind of usual clustering, pattern, ma pattern matching cohort, uh, I'm sorry, clustering cohort analysis. And that's a fairly straightforward thing to do. And I think we actually, you know, existing machine learning tools could do that in a simple way. But that's not actually going to get you much distance over an 11 dezillion wide uh, problem. And so 11 dezillion is a technical term. Um, so another approach, which used to be called explanation-based generalization, and now it's called causal Bayesian networks, is essentially you use the explanation. So notice that an explanation is going to walk from a set of observations through some proof, that is to say through some inference, proof may be too strong, um, to some decision. Right? And so you can use this trace to tell you which pieces of the space are related to which other pieces of the space, essentially. Okay? And that used to be called EBL or EBG. And these days, it's essentially the same thing as a causal Bayes net um, process to do it statistically. Go ahead. So again, so we do the math. You've got a few thousand instances of a molecular tumor board per year. Right. At most. Yeah. Um, it still seems very, very sparse. It's very, very sparse, but it's way less sparse than if you didn't have that the knowledge coming from the tumor boards, because you've got the exact same number of cases, but a lot less guidance. Now you could be misguided, that would be the only downside. In other words, if they're going someplace that's actually in the wrong part of the space, which is possible, um, then, uh, but hopefully you would learn that There's in process. Sort of a, you know, it's sort of, you can generalize <coughs> to a limited part of the space nearby what the cases that, and the issues that they have. To right, absolutely. Have. But they're all the hardest cases. So that's what really comes down the line, uh -huh. right? Yeah. So all, almost all of the hardest cancer cases end up at a tumor board or the equivalent of a tumor board. Um, the easy cases are easy, right? So basically, this is, if nothing else, a way of throwing away the data you don't care about. Right? Um, you don't want to look at every bit of the EHR. You don't want to look at everybody's records because that's you know, dealt with, essentially. And I agree with you. It's not, you're not going to solve the problem entirely. By looking at it. It's an additional source of data or source of hints, source of guidance, essentially. Um, so the second approach here is uh, a company that actually I, I co-founded called Collabrex. And what it did was essentially used <coughs> experts to build an expert system. And I'll just show you what it does. So they, they, the experts built a model just like the MMMP folks built a model. But the model here, again, was into, this sort of was more explicit. They both had a molecular model and they just had a model in the sense of a set of hypotheses, set of clusters, you know, phenotypes, functional phenotypes. And 
there was a tool and you could put in your stuff and it would give you guidance. Now I'm going to go, I'm, the reason I'm going through this is that I'm going to go back to a picture. One thing is we, these models were open. There was actually even an API to them. So you could actually go into the models and pull some, actually you still can as far as I know. Um, and uh, published. So peer reviewed at at least an instant in time. Right? How a model gets peer reviewed in general. But the interesting thing was our approach, our answer to Watson was this thing we called Norman. And uh, what Norman did, so notice this guy's face. This is Ravi Salgia. He's one of the top lung cancer guys in the world. He was willing to put his face on this app. <laughs> all right? Now, the in, uh, for no money. Okay? Now, the interesting thing about that is it's not just him. There's actually a bunch of thought-leading lung cancer guys and girls yeah, um, in this particular set of people. So... What we were doing initially was taking advantage of this virtual tumor board, if you will. Okay? But we wanted to do that in a semi-automated way. So that's where our version of Watson, which we called Norman, came from. So what happened is, so any old-time Star Trek folks will recognize this if you don't look it up. Um, Norman was the coordinator. All right? So what happens here is we would pull down the usual suspects from databases. All right? And pull the data of what was actually happening in the apps, which are the actual instances you're seeing, right? So those are the cases walking in the door. <laughs> and Norman would essentially look in there and look at our models, and his job was to update the models. But the way it worked was, not automatic, all right? What it would do is it would create a case, write it out using a template that said, you know, a patient presented with blah, 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 depending on what Norman's sort of hypothesis for updating the model was, and send it to these guys. Right? Um, now, there was actually a human intervention in the email part of it, but basically the idea is that you would write a case out and give it to a doctor and say, what would you do in this particular case? And we would give ranking hypotheses. And they'd say, you know, yeah, that's fine. Or no, that's not good because such and such. So the idea was to <coughs> wrap in the experts into the process. We weren't just reading the database. We weren't just reading the, the knowledge, uh, data and knowledge bases. We were also winding the updating process through the experts you might argue partly because we didn't have the technology to do it automatically. I don't think the technology can exist to do it automatically at this point in time, if for no other reason than dimensionality arguments. Um, finally, and this gets to your point about military quite directly, I'm going to talk about this thing called the Actually, there's, an, there's a, another finally, but it's just one slide. So you remember you've got this nexus of experts, and they're not always in the same room. Um, so how can temporally and spatial especially virtual MTBs, keep track of what's going on. There's an approach that the intelligence community uses called ACH, which is um, analysis of competing hypotheses. And this is taught to intelligence analysts as the way to analyze political intelligence. Right? What they do basically is they have you know, some set of hypotheses, some set of evidence. They make a matrix, and they're trained to fill in, e oops, this is here, to fill in every cell in this as to whether the evidence is concordant with the hypothesis, discordant or neutral with respect to the hypothesis. That's just the intelligence technology, right? You can do the obvious thing. It's just a spreadsheet, essentially. So you might say, well, what if you have a bunch of different people doing this or different teams at different times and place? So one approach, which I call the, the Google wave of collaborative decision making, is you have everybody pile on the same matrix. <laughs> So essentially, you take however many analysts there are, you build a huge matrix which has, uh, this, you know, has like hundreds of different hypotheses. This is usually like bomb a rack, don't bomb a rack. So like at the, at, the, at the top level, it's these gross hypotheses. Every piece of information you have, and there are like 10 analysts trying to make consensus out of this, right? This is like a terrible idea. Um, but I think it's actually being used <laughs> in military collaborative intelligence analysis. So another idea which arose, from a, an ARTA project was this thing called a Bayesian community. <coughs> the ACH idea is very powerful because it's, think of it as these matrices are mind-sized as long as they don't get out of control. One analyst has one matrix, or maybe a small group of analysts has one matrix. They're really kind of working their problem. Think of one tumor board working on one patient, right? Or one science, scientific group working on one, you know, one drug. They would work on their problem, and the trick is, how do you get them to interact without knowing they're interacting? in some organized way. And so what you do is you give them each their own ACH matrix. You don't make them all pile into the same matrix. And then you wire them together in the background. Essentially, the 
output wires from one become the input wires to the next where relevant, right? So for example, if these, so this is a tumor board. This is some set of microarray analyses about some particular drug's impact on a gene, right? And I'm totally making up this example. And this is a set of personal, it's the same picture in all of these. Um, and this is something about personal, uh, personal biomarker observations. And so to the extent that these guys need this information, they'll draw it from something which has evidence sitting under it. The evidence sitting under it is being worked on by a team just working on that problem, right? Um, if these guys update their results, it'll bubble through the network. Hopefully it's a DAG. Um, if not, I'm sure it can be dealt with. And you could change basically the ranking of treatments on the end, right? So this was an idea. It was implemented. We can't tell whether the intelligence community ever used it um, because they, of course, wouldn't tell us. Um, but essentially, the idea is to, it, it draws on this idea that the ACH matrices are mind size, and that works very well for the intelligence community. And so you can imagine a group, teams at different levels of science working on the problem. At the end, you're trying to treat a patient, but all this data is coming in the bottom, all the way down to, you know, sensors, if you like. Um, there's a lot more to say about that I won't go into. So the last thing, just very briefly, is this idea of global cumulative treatment analysis. As I implied there, it's not just one tumor board, right? And to your point, um, you know, how many tumor boards are there? There aren't a huge number, but there's enough that it's not one. Um, and so what you want to do is, since you've got multiple tumor boards, you don't want them all doing the same either smart or stupid thing in parallel. You basically don't want this to operate as a trivially parallelizable system which it now is doing, right? Because the only way to connect them if you don't have the Bayes community model is through the literature, which is incredibly slow, right? So there's no high throughput, <laughs> you know, there's no Hadoop uh, communication system or connection machine communication system would be a better model. So essentially it's, it's hundreds of these tumor boards operating, all seeing similar patients, right? <laughs> so the idea of global cumulative treatment analysis is that you, in the normal case, the green is just the normal case. Basically, someone shows up, you have a treatment hypothesis. If there's a, if there's a best choice, then they do it. If there's no best choice, if there's no acceptable choices at all, then you basically have to do science, all right? But if, there are, if there's equipoise, if you don't have statistical strength enough to make a choice, essentially what you do is you do, um, you, you do basically the equivalent of exploration and exploitation trade-off you say from reinforcement learning. You say, okay, what's the best choice to be given to this patient for learning purposes? But you have to be watching the entire community in order to do this properly. Now you might say, this is nuts, right? You'd need a giant connected computer system watching all of the different patients coming in all over the world to do this, right? Did anyone think this is nuts? This is nuts. Um, you could just choose randomly and it would be pretty close. Um, you... It would be space slightly less efficiently. Yeah, but remember, you have very few patients. Yes, you would exploit it less efficiently. But let's say you wanted to. Well, I don't know, but uh, somebody apparently thinks that this is a good idea because there is a giant connected computer system called the VA. All right, and the VA actually does this. So the VA, this is called a point of care trial, um, and uh, the what they do is a patient comes in, and if the patient, they get given, you know, choice A, B, the patient and doctor get given choice, you know, A or B. If they have a preference, the preference gets given. If they don't have a preference, the preference doesn't get given. If they, um, they don't have a preference, normally it would be given randomly, okay? But what happens in the VA system is the computer chooses, all right? And then there's a whole theory. I have a paper on this if you want to see the theoretical reasons for it, and, and you're right, it's, in many circumstances, it would be good enough to give randomly, but if you have a very limited pool to choose from and the dynamics are such, then you really want to take advantage of. Yeah, exactly, right. Um, and in cancer, it's, that's the situation. You've got relative to the dimensionality of the problem, the N is, to your point, very, very small. Um, so you don't want to replicate experiments if you don't have to. The problem is, in fact, that in cancer, the dimensionality is so big that often N is just one. Yes, but that's exactly also, right. <laughs> well, fair, fair enough. Um, so anyway, this is called global cumulative treatment analysis. It's a horrible picture. I have no idea how to depict where you, what you want to do here. But basically, you want to somehow have these guys interacting over uh, making choices in a sensible way, right? And then recording in more or less real time the relationships between the choices 
and getting them to do different things to search the space. One is you just pick a random treatment. Two is you send it to a molecular tumor board. They make a decision which you record the reasoning. Oh, no. So the order is the other way around. So what, um, um, if I understand what you're asking, which I, I may not quite. So what happens is the molecular tumor board will often try and find a trial for the patient. Once the patient goes into a trial, then it's chosen randomly in the trial, usually. Okay, if it's an adaptive trial, which is essentially what the point of care trial is, but that's a local adaptive trial, then what happens is there's some, you know, calculation done about which arm to put the patient in. Okay, and there's lots of, mod basically, if you're really interested, if you're interested in the statistics of science, the coolest place to look right now is in adaptive clinical trials because the, you know, really smart people are trying to figure out exactly how to use this information in the most mm -hmm. important way. And tools for, they have plenty of tools themselves, but basically they're, they're essentially run simulations all the time. Um, so uh, I, think, I think the order is the other way around. Um, so this global cumulative treatment analysis is trying to envision what would happen if you could coordinate over the tumor boards and have the tumor boards also intercoordinated through something like a base community model, right? Um, so we're trying to do all of that stuff simultaneously. <laughs> and there you have it. Questions, comments, other than the ones you've made. Thank you for your attention. Any other questions? The basic message is don't get cancer. <laughs> um, that was what the onion said. Yeah. Cancer researchers recommend not getting cancer. Yes, exactly. That I think they all agree on that. I think they all agree on that one. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, no, really, from a from a statistical standpoint, it's a horribly difficult problem. In fact, essentially intractable. So we're, we're picking at the bits and pieces of information we can get, and we don't want to lose information, and we don't want to waste subjects, essentially. Um, and so, you know, it's not clear random would be. By the way, uh, to your point about random, you're right that it would be close if they went random, but they're not even doing random. What they're doing is channelizing. So what happens is they all read the last published report, and they all do thing A. Right. So that's the worst possible version of it. That you really want to avoid. Okay. The trial system, which I was describing to you, does randomize in the trivial way. The adaptive ones randomize in a slightly smarter way. The vision of it is to do a grand version of the VA's point of care trial, where you're actually random. The computer is taking advantage of what's going on. That's very complicated because the, the dynamics of cancer are so horrible that um, well, cancer in general is horrible, but the dynamics are very poor in the sense that you don't get real outcomes data for a long time. Even if you're looking at local. Um, result, local uh, results like a tumor load. So what will often happen is, not often, but there are cases where um, suppose you're treated here times zero, and then, uh, so you have two different treatments, and one of the treatments seems to be doing much better than the other treatment. Well, if you start taking the data away from the, uh, sorry, the other way, if you start trying taking the patients away from the one that's doing poorly and giving the one that's doing well, you're taking away the statistical power of this set of observations. So there are cases where they cross over again, but you won't see it because you've taken all the statistical data, a statistical power away from this case. So the whole adaptive trial thing is very, very interesting and, and complicated. Um, and fraught with ethical problems. Yes, absolutely. So you mentioned this uh, uh, point of care in VA. Right. Um, like the obvious question for a researcher is like, is there <coughs> opportunity to engage outside? Like, how do they figure out the outreach? So, well, the, so Phil, it's either, <laughs> so the, the primary paper is by Fiori dot 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 Lavori or Lavori dot 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 Fiori. I think it's, and once it's like Phil Lavori and Lou Fiori or it's Phil Fiori and Lou Lavori. Uh, anyway, the point is, if you look up Fiori and Lavori, um, and Lavori, or maybe it's Fiori, is at Stanford in public health. Um, and we've been talking to him about how to do this global thing. He designed the study, right, that particular thing. But there are folks designing adaptive trials, you know, uh, uh, there are many adaptive trials being designed. Lots of interesting work in designing trials that take as much advantage of the information as possible. So it's really a, I, I call it, I think in the talk at DARPA, I called it robot science for real. You know, people talk about a robot in a laboratory running science. Well, this is, you know, you want to basically run the entire medical community as though you had control over it and were actually <coughs> making decisions in a sensible way with respect to the statistics. That's very hard to do. 
the, the, the VA can do it, right? Because they have a giant connected computer system and they control all decisions, right? To the extent they can. I mean, patients really control all decisions. They also have access to all the data, right? Go ahead. Has it happened that some widow or widower says, why, 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 did, why did he die because he chose this treatment? Why did he choose this treatment? Because it would improve the statistics. Um, well, but that's the way trials work now. Right, and that I'm sure has happened all the time, but that's an ethical issue that trials have faced forever. And so I don't think this is any worse than that. Um, all right, anyway, uh, clear questions? Thank you.